going to get on the show here. We're going to get through the, uh, the philosophical thing of the endangered species and the ramifications of doing it. But it's nice always to come to the big city to do a presentation. This is a community that, that myself and Pat live in. Uh, we call this the Tri-Cities area of Wyoming. My office is down in the Metropolitan District of Bags. If you ever come through there, one look us up. So just a little bit about the valley. John C. Fremont came through there in 1844. In his journals, he described it as an area where he'd seen more, more various species of game and more game than any place else in all of his travels back and forth across the continent, uh, or across the nation looking for an uh, overland route. Uh, you know, it's a few years later, there was another expedition that came through there in 1855, the Stansbury Expedition, and actually established the Overland Trail, which was used heavily. So we got a really good history in journals of what that area looked like, and the, uh, the ecology and the wildlife, and it was very robust. Um, so we know we're dealing with something special, but you know, in the light of endangered species, sometimes in this day and age, uh, it creates a lot of fear, because in the 25 years I've been in my job, We've got at least 20 different species that have been petitioned or suggested for petition and listing. And that's the byproduct of living in a very rural conquer community with a very fairly intact ecosystem. So we really have a bullseye on that. Well, with that in mind, early on, uh, uh, a little more history about the valley, but early on, um, my board of directors said, you know, we're not going to run for problems, so we're going to address it. And we've embraced that for conservation with the philosophy that you do that with sustainable communities. So I'm just going to run through, you know, all the issues that we've tried to grapple with over the years. Uh, native fish, uh, we've got four or five different species, Colorado River cutthroat, largest enclave in, in the state of Wyoming, wild mouse suckers, round-tailed chubs, blue-headed suckers, two of those four have been suggested or petitioned for listing over the years. So when we got into a project a few years ago saying, look, we did a barrier assessment with Trout Unlimited. We identified over 44 different barriers for native fish. Um, we started into this. Um, we've now converted all but one irrigation district and all, water, <coughs> all irrigation diversion structures for fish passage in that entire watershed. Where eight years ago, fish couldn't go more than a couple of miles before it ran into a barrier. Pretty common, you see up here, the one up in the upper left was the typical push-up dam that was common in our area. You just get in the creek every year and shove up the gravel. You strand the fish, the temperatures get hot, creates problems. Anywhere from constructed barriers where we've gone in and we've modified these, these are about a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars a piece. But we've done the whole watershed. We've got one left. The fish can now start in the town of bags and go to the continental divide and turn around and come back for the fall trip. Um, expensive project, but something worth doing. But it was to a great degree under the threat of the Endangered Species Act that we said, look, if we don't reduce these threats of habitat fragmentation, we're part of the problem. And it's always been our charge to be part of the solution. So, dealing with the native fish, just some of the other things we deal with, no different than you do here. Uh, Transbasin diversions, hydrological modifications to the system, alterations of the hydrology to existing and, or historic grazing practices. So this is, is just a project. We went into a major restoration effort for Colorado River Cutthroat, a lot of eroding banks, for a lot of the reasons I just talked about. Um, but part of the thing that's unique about this is we try to see those opportunities where they exist where you address one issue by utilizing another. In this case, uh, we were dealing with declining aspen communities, so we took those conifers out of those aspen communities, brought them down and used them for stream restoration, uh, trying to benefit that. Part of that is we've also got into a larger aggressive effort in major river restoration. Um, Little Snake's average annual dis discharge is about 4,000 CFS. Uh, we've done about 10 miles and associated with those 14 diversion structures now. Just shows some of the biotechniques we go putting in tunnel wood for revetments on those banks, narrow and deepen that channel, protect those cottonwood gallery forests. Uh, pretty expensive but elaborate project. Um, this is kind of the final results when you get done with that, but you've got those root wads with the willow plantings all the way along the outside of those banks. And then just upstream of that, you see one of those diversion structures that we removed and placed with the natural rock vein diversions. 
Um, we've been heavily involved in wetlands for over 20 years. Uh, started with this situation with the picture up on the right. It's now the largest constructed wetland area uh, in the state of Wyoming. There's over 1,300 acres of wetlands out there. It's just surface acres of wet area. It doesn't include all the mesic and wet meadows, but it started out with humble beginnings with just trying to deal with erosion and a head cut to a situation that looks like that. As we moved down, we worked with mitigation banks to do some stuff, but also mitigation for trans-based diversions. And it just shows the only issue is, is that little stream on the right to return flows, cleaned up the water, was a significant improvement of the water quality issues that we're dealing with. But you know, it's an interesting thing. When you build it, they will come. Uh, we now have literally thousands of migratory birds, waterfowl, shorebirds. This is in the Red Desert. This wetland complex is in a nine inch precip zone, folks. We have tundra swans. We have a magnitude of white faced ibis, egrets, uh, over 125 avian species now use this area. We have three ranching families that use this area. So I'm going to zip through some more of this stuff and just kind of get to some of the other issues. This is one I think that's important. We were doing sage grouse work 20 years ago and we didn't even know. You guys probably remember Cab Free in 93. That's about time I started this job. We had some crazy issues out there. So we said, well, we're going to bury our head in the sand or are we going to address it? So we went in and said, no, we're going to address them. So you're just going to go through a series of photographs right now. A little muddy creek in 1983 all the way down to 2011. We restored native fish composition in three of the Colorado River fish species, including cutthroats, wildmouse, roundtails, all in this habitat in the strainage. This goes to show you how resilient Mother Nature can be with just a little help. We still graze every one of these areas. Haven't reduced AUMs one iota. We just went in there with a good plan management system, uh, season of use, uh, deferred grazing programs, upland water, just the normal tools you'd normally use, work with those ranchers uh, to address those issues. So we see this throughout the watershed, but when you talk about what that means to a sage grouse, it's pretty significant to have those riparian areas, those little green strips all the way through the habitat there. Uh, just going down the watershed, just another watershed that we worked on early on. That's the same picture, that's, that's just willows and cottonwoods that came in, and the only thing we did was just modify the grazing systems. Um, heavily into uh, mule deer and sage grouse. This is some, uh, if we get into the next picture, that's the Mount Mahogany, the most desirable mule deer food we have on the winter range, but we're heavily encroached with juniper. Uh, that's a picture at the same hillside, and if you look up, you see the, the vigor improving in that Mount Mahogany community. Uh, the understory that comes up through that with the perennial forbs and shrubs is pretty substantial, benefits both mule deer, livestock, and sage grass. Um, again, Mount Mahogany picture, just some before and after of the juniper treatments. Uh, Aspen's been an area that we've had a heavy focus in. Again, part of the watershed effort of moving conifers in the, in the Aspen community. So just shows the, again, some of our restoration efforts. We have about 70, 78,000 acres of occupied Aspen habitat. We've treated about five in the last 10 years. Uh, which is about the right rate of turnover for that plant community within that watershed. Vitally important, it's a keystone species for our agriculture and wildlife and our community uh, because it provides that understory of forage. So with that, I'm going to whip through just a couple more of these to show you some more of the project. Oh, I love these. Here's some sage grass. Where'd they go? You know, one of the things I want to leave you with is, is every species has a certain capacity to adapt. And that includes sage grouse. So one of the things I've started doing is asking all of my uh, ranching friends and other people is to take pictures of every time they see a sage grouse doing something that they're not supposed to, like sitting on the barn. Remember, they avoid structures. He said that sage grouse sit out there for a week every day. They are seeing that's a reclaimed area on an oil and gas pad. Uh, again, some of the oil and gas. Oh, I lost my plug. Well, with that, I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts on collaboration in 25 years of working in a small community. First, I'm going to tell you my experience is, is you don't collaborate with agencies or organizations, you collaborate with people. And you got to find those people within those agencies. And another thing that I'd like to give you my observation is if you go into collaboration and you think it's a process, you're going to be disappointed because process always starts and stops. What we've been able to do over 25 years is learn 
collaboration is just a way of doing business. And it's the best way of doing business. And I want to leave you with the three rules that we should all try to strive to when we work with people, because people are the fundamental principle that makes all collaboration work. My dad gave me this, and I didn't understand it. It took me 10 years of being mad at people because I didn't understand. But I'm going to read you what will make everybody's lives easier than everything you do if you understand people. So I'm going to give you the three axioms, those principles that we should always follow. People resist what's forced upon them. People tend to mistrust what they don't understand. And people will support what they help create. You know, it's a much more productive environment <clears throat> my last 15 years in this career than the first 10 years. I'm not mad anymore, but we got a lot of partners out there, folks. Thank you. <laughs>